Christa Gieselson and Master Sander also discovered a method of suppressing the ignition of fire gases using nozzles capable of producing a fine water mist. The water mist creates a protective shield for the firefighter and is able to cool fire gases before they ignite and also, more importantly, to reverse flashovers, backdrafts and fire gas explosions before they happen, making the BA attack much safer to perform. We produce very small drops, uh, very small distance between the drops uh, and it actually worked like a Davis net and anybody could see that it worked. You could actually put out flames with water and you could cool smoke gases with water. It was obvious for everybody who saw it. Because it's rather delicate, the heat balance, if I can just cool it off a bit, it will extinguish the flame. Then again, if I heat up the net so much that it loses its cooling effect, you will see the flame pass through the net. Here it comes. So it's only a matter of cooling the flame to under the outer ignition temperature and the flame will go out instantly. With water, I have this fantastic nozzle here, a flower spray, which produces very small drops. And if I use this one on the flame, it should be working as good as a Davis net. By creating a variable nozzle head working at six bars of pressure, the Fogfighter prototype became the first universal fog nozzle tool. With a flick of the wrist, it could be converted from a fine water mist into a conventional water beam producing 300 liters or just under 80 US gallons per minute. The Fogfighter was developed first as a prototype and then mass produced by a private Swedish company, Tour and Andersson, based on the specifications of what Gieselson and Rosander wanted the new nozzle to accomplish. By producing water droplets small enough to create a netting effect, the flame cannot pass through the water shield. The reason the flame cannot pass through is that the water droplets are so small that the flame appears denser than the water shield. The fog nozzle became integral to a whole new way of working. Protected by the water shield, a BA team could go deeper into burning buildings. And, if they arrived early enough, they could apply water mist from their fog nozzles to stop the fire from flashing over. The method, later termed offensive interior firefighting, was born. Which, in essence, meant that instead of focusing to, towards the seat of the fire, you should mix the gases, mix them with enough water droplets to cool it down and to reduce the risk for, for what we today call a flashover. So offensive firefighting, attacking the fire by mixing the smoke with the uh, droplets that would cool it down and lessen the, the risk for ignition of the smoke layer. Since 1983, only a small handful of Swedish firefighters have died in the line of duty. Most of them have died in traffic accidents during call-outs. Only three firefighters in that period have died inside burning buildings. The Swedish knowledge of this is well known all over Europe. You can go to Hungary, you can go to Greece or whatever. They know that Sweden is on the top level when it comes to smoke diving training to handle flashovers, backdraft and, and so on. Uh, and the knowledge of each single firefighter is actually the key to that. Since 1986, the Swedish fire and rescue services have been operating on one simple philosophy when it comes to safety. Basically, it boils down to the idea that every firefighter is his or her own safety officer. If anybody in the fire team sees anything that doesn't seem safe, he or she has the right to call off the entire BA operation. No questions asked. A superior officer cannot even legally question the call. This is true whether you're a high-ranking officer in a large city 
or a volunteer nautical man in a small brigade in the countryside. Because the commanding officer has limited view and limited understanding of what happened inside a burning building or, or a building that is full of smoke. The BA group or the SCBA group, as they say in the United States, they, they have to be his ears, eyes and sensors with an understanding how the situation is and how it might develop. It has to be a knowledge of the single firefighter and that takes a long time to acquire. Although Sweden has been traditionally seen as a socialist country, this egalitarian way of treating the line of command is far from the expression of a political view. This is the result of the high degree of training and understanding in fire behavior that the Swedish firemen traditionally have received. For decades, Swedish firefighters have been trained in so-called flashover training. All active firefighters, not only officers, but everyone from volunteers to professionals, have received regular training on how to deal with fire gases. The training happens in especially equipped flashover containers, and sometimes also in real buildings. During the flashover training, they learn to read the fire and to judge on the smoke when a sudden and violent fire development can be expected. Through the use of fog nozzles, they also learn to cool fire gases and how to use the water to protect themselves from potential fire gas ignitions. By the mid-80s, another young firefighter by the name of Anders Laurien developed another groundbreaking training method, the flashover container. He dedicated a lot of time, a lot of effort into spreading the use of uh, ordinary steel freight containers to be used for live fire training instead of using huge abandoned buildings. He scaled it down to a reasonable size and made these uh, training events much less dangerous. Basically you could say that these training events in a steel container 40 feet, it's not dangerous at all. Of course, you can get burns, but you will not be killed. The concept of the flashover container is simple and portable. The advantage is that any fire service, regardless of size, can practice with these containers. I think it's great. It's, uh, I'm really looking forward to trying it within the container uh, to see how it cools the gases uh, uh, to get a more realistic feel for uh, the, the technique because that's what the box is about, teaching you those techniques. Over the years, Sweden has sent instructors to several countries around the world to teach the use of flashover containers. Many have also come to Sweden to study. This video footage is from 2009 at the Sandu College of Fire and Rescue when fire officers from Germany, Spain, England, Australia, New Zealand, the US and Canada came to study the Swedish model. I think it's excellent. Uh, I think that um, the techniques, uh, I'm really inefficient. Uh, I'd need lots of training and I think that's what they do here as they uh, prepare people to handle this type of firefighting. And I, completely see the value of it and uh, I would like to see it introduced as a set of tactics uh, within my own department. This training is uh, very important because we think you need to train the firemen to be in as uh, close as reality. If we ne you never train against real fire, you will have to learn by the real accidents. You maybe lose life. Since the 1990s, firemen from all over the world has come to Sweden to learn about flashover training. One of the first to learn about flashover training was Paul Taylor, known as the man who brought fire gas cooling to the UK. This is right on the edge. This is near enough to reality as you're going to get, apart from the actual building being on fire, apart from the safety precautions, it is reality. And the thing about it is it's a step up from the container training where you can put the, you can describe, or prescribe, should I say, the loading. You can put in as much chipboard as you want or as little. Here, you've got a variable inside the room that you're not, you don't know what it is, so you're up against it. And again, it's the psychological barrier for the firefighter has to overcome. It's working with fear, you should train with fear. 